You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Useless information. Hi, I'm Steve Silverman, and you're listening to a classic episode of the Useless Information Podcast. This episode, The Cranberry Crisis in 1959, was first released four days before Thanksgiving back in 2009. That was November 22nd, if you want to be specific. Anyway, I was curious where I first learned about the story, so I went upstairs and I pulled out my research folder for it. I have to tell you, there was nothing in there that gave me even the slightest hint. But I did observe two things. First, I had quite a number of old newspaper articles in the folder, which was very unusual for 2009. I have to tell you, it was still quite difficult at that point to do research online. So I was kind of amazed to see how many articles I had been able to track down. And after reviewing my script, I couldn't help but notice how many typos there were. While I'm quite certain I would have had a spell checker back then, I really doubt I had much in the way of a grammar checker. All I can say is if I did have one, it wasn't working very well when I wrote that story. Anyway, enjoy. Welcome to the Useless Information Podcast, my collection of fascinating true stories from the flip side history. My name is Steve Silverman. Today's story is called The Cranberry Crisis of 1959. But before we do that, let's start with today's question of the day. For today's question of the day, I thought I'd ask you about English language punctuation marks and one that's very unusual. As you know, there's the apostrophe, the period, question mark, colon, semicolon, exclamation point, uh, comma, and the dash. Those are the ones I wrote down. But there's also something called the interrobang. And my question for you today is, what is the interrobang? And here's a little hint. It's a combination of two of the more common punctuation marks. So my question for you is, what is the interrobang? And I'll let you know the answer at the end of this podcast. And now for today's story, which I've called The Cranberry Crisis of 1959. Now with Thanksgiving here once again in the United States, I thought it was the perfect time to discuss the darkest day ever, ever, to occur in cranberry history. It's the Great Cranberry Scare from 50 years ago this month. Now, today's story starts on Monday, November 9th, 1959, 50 years ago, a day referred to many in the cranberry industry as Black Monday. You see, on this date, Arthur Fleming, who was the U.S. Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare at the time, announced that two lots of cranberries that had been grown in Oregon had been contaminated with aminotriazole, which is a weed killer that was suspected at the time of causing cancer. You see, Fleming simply wanted to warn consumers that additional berries, which came from the Pacific crop, mainly the states of Oregon and Washington, not Washington, D.C., which at the time represented roughly 9% of the national cranberry output, could also be contaminated with this aminotriazole. Now, he did point out that tests on berries from the other leading cranberry states, basically those east of the Rocky Mountains, uh, New Jersey, Wisconsin, and Massachusetts, had shown no sign of contamination. They were believed to be safe. But when a reporter questioned Fleming on how the typical housewife, at least typical in the 1950s, would know if the berries were safe, he made a simple reply. He said, and this is in quotes, to be on the safe side, she doesn't buy. And that's the end of the quote. Now, keep in mind that this announcement was made 17 days before Thanksgiving. And back in 1959, nearly all of the cranberries were consumed between Thanksgiving and Christmas. The timing just couldn't have been worse for the cranberry industry. By the next day, the newspapers coast to coast were plastered uh, on the front page with headlines telling people not to buy and not to eat cranberries. And I'll just read you a few of the uh, headlines that I wrote down. Government warns the cranberry crop has been contaminated. How about Northwest cranberries ordered off the market? Another one is grocery chains remove berries. And another is cooks better pass up cranberries for Thanksgiving. And here's a real doozy. Ohio bars Washington and Oregon berries. Another is Ohio San Francisco banned cranberry sales. And my favorite is cooks better pass up cranberries for Thanksgiving warns Uncle Sam. And you can just go and check the old newspapers and see just about every newspaper in the country had this on the front page. Needless to say, cranberry sales were squashed 
across the nation. Get it, squash? Oh, okay, pretty bad. Anyway, it didn't matter what uh, state the cranberries came from. It didn't matter if they were East Coast or West Coast or wherever. They were being tossed out by everyone. So let's take a step back for a moment uh, for a bit of background on this problem. And the main reason for the scare was a 1958 amendment to the Food, Drugs, and Cosmetic Act of 1938. And it included a statement, and this is in quotes, the Secretary of the Food and Drug Administration shall not approve for use in food any chemical additive found to induce cancer in man or after tests found to induce cancer in in animals. And that's the end of the quote. Now, this clause, which was introduced by New York Representative James Delaney and is now known as the Delaney Amendment, of course, had very, very good intentions. Uh, it was obviously intended to keep poisons out of our food, but it had an unintended consequence. And that was no matter how small the amount, the FDA could ban products. Basically, you know, there was no threshold established. There could be one molecule of that poison or suspected carcinogen there, and they could ban the food. Now, preliminary tests on the pesticide aminotriazole had shown that mega doses of it caused cancer of the thyroid in lab rats. There really was no evidence at the time that it caused cancer in humans. But even the tests on the rats were inconclusive at the time. And get this, aminotriazole had been approved by the federal government for use on cranberry crops the previous year. You see, aminotriazole killed the weeds, but didn't harm the bushes. The only catch was that it couldn't be applied until after the fruit, until after the cranberries were harvested. Unfortunately, and it always happened, some growers were using it before harvest to increase their yields. If they'd only followed the directions on the bag, this whole mess could have been avoided. But it turns out that there was so little aminotriazole on the cranberries that the public really was never in any danger. The government later determined that one would need to eat 15,000 pounds of cranberries every single day for several years to be exposed to the same level of aminotriazole that caused the formation of the tumors in these rats. Kind of sounds like you know the saccharin story that came about, about years later. Now, even if there was a significant danger from the aminotriazole contamination, there was really no need for a nationwide warning. And that's because in 1959, the cost of shipping across the country was just too prohibitive. There was no way to ship uh, the berries from the West Coast to the East Coast. It was just cheaper to get East Coast berries. So anyone on the East Coast was in no danger of the contamination. So the federal government had to quickly backpedal it as somehow restore confidence to the cranberry market, and announcements were made to the public, of course, minimizing the threat, but they were just ignored. The papers, you know, like bad news, sensational news. They don't want to just announce some humdrum thing that, you know, hey, your cranberries are safe to eat. It just didn't happen. So then Secretary of Agriculture Ezra Taft Benson announced that he would have cranberries on his plate and on his family's Thanksgiving table, and no one else should worry about it. And people just kind of ignored it. Even the presidential candidates got in on the game. While campaigning in Wisconsin, Senator John F. Kennedy, who did become the president, drank two glasses of cranberry juice. But not to be outdone, uh, Vice President Tricky Dick Nixon himself ate four helpings of cranberries. But there was an even bigger problem. They had to somehow bail out the cranberry industry. Bailout sounds kind of familiar these days. Anyway, they had to bail out the cranberry industry to prevent it from total financial ruin. 1959 just happened to have been a record yield crop, and the growers would probably be put out of business from this disaster. So in an effort to fix this mess, 10 days after the announcement of the tainted berries, the government announced that it was putting into action its berry plan. They had already cleared 6,304,000 pounds of berries and they were believed to be pesticide-free and could be released to the market. The only catch was that all the cleared berries had to be labeled, and here's two more quotes for you, they either had to be labeled, quote, examined and passed by the Food and Drug Administration of the United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, that's the end of the first quote, or the second quote is, certified safe under the plan approved by the U.S. government for cranberries, and that's the end of the second quote. Personally, a simple OK by the FDA stamp would have been good enough for me. The government purchased all of the seized crops for an estimated $9 million in the end, 
but the estimated loss of the industry was believed to have been even greater. Estimates, you know, in the newspapers ran as uh, high as $40 million overall, although today most experts think it was probably more in the $15 to $20 million range. As you could probably guess, the entire 1960 crop was grown without the weed killer. Um, but there was no guarantee that anyone would buy the berries. So the federal government stepped up to the plate and appealed to the public to consume more cranberries. Maybe not the 15,000 pounds per day, but more than in the past. And starting two months prior to Thanksgiving, the Fed started telling the public that the 1960 crops were totally safe. And not only that, they also stated that the 1959 berries, the ones that were involved in the scare, were totally safe because, and this is a quote, you couldn't possibly eat enough cranberries treated with aminotriazole to induce cancer. And that's the end of that quote. In the end, the 1959 disaster was actually a big help to the industry in the long run. And the reason for that is that within 10 years, sales were double their 1959 volume. Ocean Spray, which controlled 75% of the cranberry crop back then, produced just three products, and that was fresh cranberries, whole berries, and jellied sauces. Making those three products just wasn't enough, and the bigwigs at Ocean Spray realized that they needed to diversify. They needed to spread their business out somehow throughout the year. The industry could no longer depend on selling their entire annual crop between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So they started making, you know, initially making combinations of cranberry and apple, cranberry and grape juices, and so on. And as everybody knows, cranberry products are everywhere just about every day of the year now. I also wanted to clear up one big misconception about cranberries. All of those commercials you see on TV, you know, by Ocean Spray and similar companies, have everyone convinced that the plants grow in water. And that's just not true. They grow them in peat-like conditions, and then when the berries ripen, they flood the fields. And the reason they do this is very simple, because the berries float, and it's easier to harvest them. And I just wanted to make one final comment, and that is while the public's reaction to the contamination of the berries may have been somewhat overblown, actually really overblown at the time, this was a major turning point in both the federal government's and the general public's attitude towards the use of pesticides in our foods. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. And now for a few words from our retro sponsor. They'll know you've arrived when you drive up in the 1958 Edsel, the car that's truly new from nameplate to taillights. New from the front. New from the side. New from the rear. Only Edsel has the sleek, clean line design that sets it apart from the lookalike cars. And it combines new looks with the newest V8 engines in the world, the big new Edsel 400 and the power-packed Edsel 475. It is unlikely you have ever driven a car with so much real, usable power as the Edsel. And with Edsel's exclusive Teletouch Drive, you drive more safely, more easily than you ever have before. Because both hands can stay at the wheel while the Edsel shifts electrically. There's even the added luxury of new Edsel air suspension that's just like riding on air, because you are. And remember, of all the medium-priced cars, car for car, across the board, the 1958 Edsel is the one that's new and the lowest price, too. So see your Edsel dealer. Wow. I'm not sure there's a whole heck of a lot I can say about you know, what is considered to be one of those spectacular product failures in corporate history. If you're curious, the 1958 model was introduced to the market on September 4th, 1957, and then on November 19th, 1959, just a little bit over two years later, Ford announced that they were discontinuing the Edsel. There were actually three models at the time produced. In the end, Ford lost about $350 million, which in today's money would be about $1.55 billion dollars. It's a big chunk of change. In the in the time that they were building it, only 118,287 Edsels were built. 
But if you have one today, there are less than 6,000 of them remaining. If you have one today, they're worth a good chunk of change. Some of the most pristine, uh, you know, rare models have sold for $100,000, $200,000. Uh, Personally, I don't own one, so I'm not too concerned. Uh, maybe I'll get lucky someday. You never know. And now for a few totally useless yet totally true tidbits from history. It's time for what I like to call news of the weird past. Our first tidbit goes back to March 23, 1900, where it's reported that an elevator at 247 Center Street in New York City had its cable break and fell seven stories to the ground. It seems that the elevator operator, a 17-year-old named John Padota, had just been hired the day before, and it's believed that because he was unused to the operation of this elevator, he misjudged the distance to the roof of the building. So he shot through, uh, basically, to the top of the building. The cable snapped, and down they went. Padota and two of his passengers were severely injured, and one of them later died. Our next tidbit goes back to March 7, 1922, where it's reported that Max Witkowski of New York City had dropped dead while playing poker in Newark, New Jersey the previous day. It seems that Witkowski had just raised his bid when he opened his mouth, but was unable to speak. He then turned white and fell face down on the poker table. His friends then examined his hand and found out that he had just drawn a royal flush. A doctor later determined that he died of heart disease. And our last little tidbit goes back to February 21st, 1936, where it's reported that U.S. Private Arthur West had committed a murder on a Friday, was convicted on a Friday, sentenced to die on a Friday, and his appeal was denied on a Friday and was hanged, you guessed it, on a Friday at San Quentin. But that's not it. He died on Friday the 13th, 13 minutes after climbing 13 steps to the platform for a murder he had committed 13 months earlier. And if you're curious, he had killed a fellow soldier after a quarrel. And now the answer to today's question, and I ask, what is an enterobang? What kind of punctuation mark is that? Well, it turns out it's the combination of a question mark and an exclamation point. It's also known as an exclamo quest. Exclamation question, right? Exclamo quest. And to draw it, you basically draw an exclamation point and put a question mark on top of that. Or you do the reverse. You draw an exclamation point and put a hook at the top and you have a combination of an exclamation point and a question mark. Now this was invented by Martin Spector in New York City in 1962 and it was intended for when you want to ask a question but also make an emphatic and you know, answer at the same time. For example, what in the world are you talking about? You want to put a question mark there and an exclamation point. Or you did what? And you would have a question mark and an exclamation point. You combine them together and you get an intero bang. Now the name comes from intero, which is Latin for question, right? Interrogation, and bang, which is the printer slang for an exclamation point. So you get intero bang, question and exclamation in the same thing. Now, it was in vogue in the 1960s, but just never quite caught on. But oddly, if you check around the internet, you'll see it's starting to stage a bit of a comeback. Just a little interesting uh, tidbit. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's story on the Cranberry Crisis of 1959. It's a very timely story. As well as our question of the day on the Intero Bang, listening to our retro sponsor, Edsult, and the news of the weird past tidbits on the seven-story elevator plunge, an unlucky poker player, and for someone that Friday the 13th was really, really unlucky for. In fact, I guess all three stories are unlucky. If you'd like to read more true stories just like this, please be sure to get a copy of one of my books. They are Einstein's Refrigerator and Lindbergh's Artificial Heart. Both are written by me, Steve Silverman. They're available from your local bookseller online and from your local library. If for some reason you'd like to contact me, simply drop me an email at useless at steve.com. Dot Silverman dot name. That's useless at Steve dot Silverman dot name, or visit my website which is which is uselessinformation.org. That's uselessinformation.org. Lastly, as always, I'd appreciate if you could log into iTunes and leave some positive comments to help increase the number of listeners to this podcast. And once again, thanks for listening and have a great Thanksgiving.